what I found amazing, and we've, <laughs> do you want to bring the interloper in, actually? Yes. <laughs> Give us a wave. Who's this? Uh, this is young Sophia. Hello, Give Sophia. Give a wave. Give a wave. <laughs> Do you think she'll be able to answer the question? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, what, yes. what I find amazing is that you came to us after the end of your international career. So if you don't mind, we'll start there in 2007. You're 27 years old. It's two years since your last So How did you end up with us at Stoner? Well, it was pretty much by chance, to be honest. And it, it was pretty much at the end of my whole career. Um, I had shifted to the UK um, from, from Zimbabwe um, at the end of 2006 with the, with the, with the plan of yeah, completely moving out of cricket. Became uh, quite disenfranchised and disillusioned around the game and yeah, shifted to the UK, um, decided to take a completely different path um, and became a real estate agent for a year. And... Um, it was only really by chance that I got back involved with cricket. Um, the sale of one of the members' houses, um, and he, he somehow recognised the name and, and the accent, and, and sort of asked, "Well, <laughs> what the heck are you doing selling houses? Um, would you be interested in playing cricket again?" And at that stage, had no real intention of getting back involved with the game. Um, just had no desire at that stage, and he said, "Look." Come have a have a beer with um, the I think I'm not too sure if Smudge was the the club chairman or, or on the board and uh, the current captain at the time Steve Bellew and um, and he said look just have a beer that they've got some really great plans at the club um, hear them out no obligations you know just just have a, a couple of beers and um, I'll never forget we we met up in um, the pub in Newport Pagnell um, just on top of the high street there and. Yeah, great couple of hours there. Um, just been chatting and, and just kept sort of getting an idea of where the club was at and, and what the plans were and how they were looking to shape things uh, moving forward. And yeah, I think it must have been about three or four beers deep. Where <laughs> yeah, it's amazing what you agree to after <laughs> after a few beers. And uh, now I was just really, I think there was something that ignited just from the passion from from both Smudge and, and Belly. Um, just to their plans and yeah, decided oh, no, I'll come come along to winter training and um, see what that's all about. And yeah, at that stage, still a bit hesitant of whether or not to to give it a go again. Um, and I must say, after the first training, I think it was um, I think it was the first training. Steve Wharton, um, yeah, definitely definitely gave me second second guesses of whether or not this was the club that I wanted to join. <laughs> But no, it was, it was thoroughly enjoyable and, and love the, the pre-season nets and, and just the banter and just the energy again that the club had. So, yeah, it uh, was a no-brainer to, to get involved um, and, yeah, thoroughly enjoyed that first season. So, take us back to that first training session because I, when I rocked up at Stoney, it was like, hello, Andy, how are you doing? And kind of we got on with it. But I'm guessing for the guys seeing you, they're sort of going... He looks a bit like that guy, a bit like that. Were people not quite sure exactly who you were at that point? Well, I don't think I had that, that big a reputation as a, as a former international international cricketer. But um, obviously, a couple of the guys sort of knew, understood the story. Um, and everyone else was yeah, pretty pretty forthcoming. And, and, and yeah, well, Warts, uh, I'll never forget, he bowled me a bump and I hadn't faced a ball in you know, nearly two years. <laughs> And he had the cheekiest little smiling grin as if to say, you know, yep, yep, you know, just want to check what you're capable of doing. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was yeah, really good fun to get involved uh, in training the game, but just with a bunch of guys that just enjoyed playing the game for what it was worth, you know, and, and without any, yeah, ulterior motives or hidden agendas, which, yeah, loved it, loved it. Well, all those guys are still involved with Sony now. Also, looking back at the team that you played with, Steve, Simon Harmer was involved, people like George Wood and Stuart Gulliver as well. How did you fit yep. into that mix? Oh, it was, it was a great... When I look back on, the, on, that, on that team, just the mixture of one experience, you had the, the, the wily old heads of you know, Woody and, and Gully. Um, Westy was still there. Um, 
uh, I don't know where Wart's fitted in, you know, whether it's the Wiley experience head or just the, the one to keep challenging the status quo. Um, yeah, and then you had, we had a couple of young, I suppose, young up-and-coming talents um, as well, which just gave the, the team a really good mixture of that youthful energy, but, you know, the smarts of what club cricket's all about in the UK. Um, and we're bloody competitive. Uh, I think finding, you're finding and you're saying to always the sort of benchmarks um, no, I think they still are, um, but always managed to push them um, with teams like that. And obviously, getting the likes of of a Simon Harmer at, at different stages, um, he really, really helped that. Um, definitely made interesting uh, change room chat and, and shower time. I can tell you that um, with a few initiations that would have gone on and, and did happen, and a few few pranks that uh, had to be played on the youngsters. I mean, on Simon Harmer, could you tell then that he was perhaps going to make it? No, to be honest. Um, well, he came over as a top order batsman. Um, and I think he only bowled part time spin, or probably I made him bowl part time spin because I wanted to take more wickets uh, myself. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was pretty hard. I think he was only 19 at the time when he came over. So still very fresh-faced, um, just out of high school and, and that age group cricket. So I think it was always, it's quite a, I think those two, three years straight out of high school are probably really key formative years in, in any cricketer's uh, development. So at that stage, whilst he had the desire, which is often you know one of the biggest things to, to have, it was hard to get a gauge of how far he could really go because we were probably looking through the lens of him being a, a top order batsman who bowled a bit of part time spin, and then what's it four, five, six years later, he's the front line in the um, South African <laughs> Test squad as, as the front line spinner. So um, I, I'd be lying if I said yes, <laughs> but he, he knew he was a quality outfit. I mean, technically, as a as a batsman, technically he was definitely one of the best batsmen going around. Okay. Now I think I'm right in saying. In year two and three, you were captain of Stoney. Yes. Um, how did that come about? Um, oh, I don't really know. I think there wasn't any um, malicious coup that occurred. I think, I think, um, I think Delhi at the time was more content just playing and having having fun and, and without the, I suppose the the burden of of captaining the side at the time. Um, it wasn't something that I actively sought after. And, and I, what I gather, I think it was a, a mutual uh, arrangement. I, I hope it was, <laughs> um, which I thoroughly enjoyed. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, it sort of gave me a good good grip on, on especially bringing the youngsters through and giving them a bit more opportunities. Um, and obviously, again, with, with having the, the, the wise heads around you, you know, how club cricket operates in, in the UK is very different to you know, how a lot of cricket's played anywhere else in the world. So, you know, still being able to call on on the likes of Belly and and the likes of Westy and 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 again Warts to to a certain extent. Are there any games from the four years that stand out in particular for you? I mean obviously you got your ten hundreds along the way, but was it the Banterfield games that stood out more than the what games when you got hundreds? Uh yes, I, I think games against Finding um, were always, you know, what, what, the, what the team looked forward to because they were always the front runners. Um, games against Saints, for some reason, there was a lot of Saints and Peterborough. There were always the big clashes there. And I think those were more personality clashes than, um, than the, the competitiveness. Um, yeah, the, they, they always stood up because they were, they were heated and they were often very close. Um, and again, they had good quality players in, in the likes of other former pros or young up-and-comers um, that were coming through. So, yeah, those games always stood out. I, I don't think there was any one game in particular. Um, I suppose be, because you're having fun all, all, all along the way, it just all meshes up into, you know, one big, long experience that yeah, you look back and you can't really isolate one particular game or a number of games. It, it just generally was a, a great time in, in terms of seasons. 
Now, I've, I've, I've spoken to the, a few of the lads that I play with. I, I play in the thirds at the moment. No, no, we've got a WhatsApp group involving a few of the lads who have played for quite a few years. People like Jamie Walsh is in there, Sam Cole as well. Names you may or may not remember from when you were at Stony, but they all say they remember you in the nets and you always had time for people and they all, they all talk about how chuffed they were that you gave them the time at the time. So was that an important part of playing for Stony, not just scoring runs on the pitch, but helping out behind the scenes as well? Yes, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad, glad to hear that actually. It's, it's one of those things you, you can sometimes take for granted as, as, a, as, a, as a senior player or an older player um, that you, you don't actually give in back, you know, because I think cricket can be often be a very selfish or you, you sometimes get very selfish or, or inward. So, yeah, I think being able to pass on whatever bit of value you know, or advice, I think that's always important. And I'm, I'm glad that I did in, in the time there with, um, and probably more unconscious than, than deliberate, if, if that makes sense. Um, and it is something, I mean, now obviously having moved into the coaching space, it's something that you're a lot more aware of and the messaging that you are trying to pass on. And, you know, sometimes it is just a bit of pumping up of the tires or sometimes it is a bit of advice that you, you might have that's of value um, to some sort. So, yes, it, it definitely was. And, and obviously, I think because of the enjoyment that I had at the club, it was always important that you know, everyone else around was, was doing well as well or at least enjoying what they were doing. I think that's that. That's still. I mean, you still get down at Oster's Lane, COVID permitting, after the game on a Saturday evening. You get people from the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth all going down. And as our skipper yeah. in a YouTube video this week, telling everyone about your amazing twelve not out you scored that day for the fourth. So that that still goes on. One more question, yeah. Tony, and this comes from your first team captain that first season. <laughs> He asks, uh, hello, Sophia again. Is it Sophia? <laughs> it is, it is Sophia again. <laughs> hello again. Um, Mr. Bellew asks whether you remember a T20 Cup final at the county ground uh, on your birthday. Any... I, I, well, it was funny when you, when you said, does any one game stand out? <laughs> <laughs> In an earlier question. I didn't want to go to that game. <laughs> um, it, it stood out for all the wrong reasons. Um, I do remember the day. I do remember the occasion um, and very little element of the game. Um, it was a great achievement for the club and, and the team to get there. And unfortunately, we're probably let down by some poor performances by a couple of key players um, <laughs> in that team, uh, myself included. So, yes, it was a... <laughs> a day I wish I could take back and, and replay on a, on a different occasion. Um, unfortunately, it did clash with um, yeah, my 30th birthday, which it was celebrated very, very well um, by, by many at the club and uh, was hosted by the club, which was, which was fantastic. Uh, a thoroughly enjoyable um, night, which probably led into the day and afternoon and I think it was luckily for uh, for a Jared Pretorius that we actually managed to get there on time. Um, although I think it was me being the sensible one um, of all times. Right. Okay. That's Stony for now. We might come back to that in a second. Zimbabwe then, as I said at the start, 29 test matches, 82 ODIs. You played with the Flower Brothers, Heath Streak. Ray Price, who I remember when he played for my county, Worcestershire. What was that whole experience like for you? This was, I think, 2002, 2005 kind of time. What was it all about? What was it like? <sighs> if I can sum it up in one word, a, a roller coaster. Um, it, it was. It, it pretty much phew, took you from one extreme to another in terms of emotions. It obviously elated and, and yeah, it was very proud of, of you know being selected and making your debut um the opportunity to play against some of the best players at that time uh, in the world you know and, and still you know, probably of of many generations um was just yeah an amazing feeling and, and accomplishment but uh, obviously riddled with a lot of on-field and off-field politics um a lot of 
external pressures and problems within the country, um, which probably diverted everyone's attention from what we were there to do. And, and hence why, when, I suppose, in the initial question around how I ended up at Stony, you, know, you ended up with a lot of players becoming disillusioned or, or moving on. Um, and, and amazing. And, and sometimes I think it was often taken for granted because of, rightly or wrongly, um, the things that were going on. But yeah, I look back and I, I probably regret a lot of things that I didn't do uh, in that period of time that, or the opportunities that I did have. Um, but in saying that, it was you know, it, just an amazing, amazing period of time. You know, you look back and it's, yeah, it riddled with a whole lot of different emotions, experiences, um, yeah, and stories along the way as well. So taking that period of your life then, I mean, I, I've picked out two or three moments <laughs> from a cursory look at Crick Info that I think stand out from just looking at it, which we'll get to in a second. But from your point yeah. of view, what does stand out from that period? You talked about playing against some of the best players in the world. Are there any specific memories from that that you think, oh, wow, I did that? Well, I... Yeah, I think the one thing that stands out is our test victory against India. Um, and that was the very next series after they turned the Australians over in that um, follow-on test. Oh, yeah. Um, so they, they came to us um, straight after that, obviously on the high of that series. Uh, at that stage, they had never won a series in Zimbabwe. Um, and they, they turned us over in the first test, I remember quite convincingly. And going into the second test, the whole talk was obviously, you know, the, the series win and... Um, the first series winning the country, and and it was a an amazing test match, and uh, one that more, I suppose, the reason stands out more is not only the uh, victory, but the contributions that I made uh, with the bat and in the field. But just an amazing course of 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 action and cricket in day four, um, where they were firmly in the driving seat, and yes, a, a change of of. Bowler, a change of ends late in day four, just turned the game completely on its head. Um, some amazing fielding catches um, to leave us in the driving seat come day five. And um, we ended up needing 100 and I think it was 150 odd um, to, to win outright. And our coach at the time was Jeff Marsh, who um, the former Australian uh, player and, and coach. And, the significance of what we were about to do obviously didn't sit lightly with him. He was a great coach and, and just a good man manager. And uh, I mean, we, we, after we won the game, walking into the change rooms, there was he was almost in tears and he sat everyone down and at that stage there was copious amounts of um, fizzy drinks um, ready for consumption. And he, he nearly burst into tears saying, you, you don't understand the the significance of this victory um, against this opposition, considering all the, the the things that the team was going through. Um, and it was, yeah, it, it stood out as probably one of the best games that uh, I've been involved in. Um, one, just the way the game ebbed and flowed from one way to another and, and to be firmly in their hands for, and for us to pretty much steal it away from them was, was an outstanding effort. Um, and not having to rely too heavily on I suppose you, you, your flower brothers and streaks, you know, they, they, they played a contribution role to it. But um, a lot of the younger players at the time um, contributed quite wholly to that. So, um, yeah, that, that was probably one of the – that's the one game that definitely stood out um, from a results point of view um, and the significance of turning one of the top teams over. Um, and then various tours, you know, the experiences of touring England, touring Australia, um, the subcontinent – I mean, they, they all carry their own significant, I suppose, memories um, because of you read about it as a young person or as any as a cricket lover, just the, the challenges of touring first world countries or, or third world countries and the various different dynamics that come with it. And you know, just uh, again, looking, looking over that period and, and whilst it was a very short period from a career point of view, um, you, you take so many good memories away from it and so many lasting memories, you know, things that do 
end up shaping you in some way, shape or form. Um, looking at your stats, you quite like India. Your, your highest score was against them. Now, last summer, I got 98 in a friendly and got bowled, got stumped by a 12-year-old. You got 94 against India in a test match. I was gutted to get 98. How did you feel to get that 94 and be 60? Oh. You know how some people still have reoccurring dreams uh, of things? Um, yes, uh, that's still a reoccurring dream of mine. And um, to this day, I'm livid, livid that the DRS system was not in play at our time. That was, um, I mean, those were the days when home teams still had home umpires. Yeah. Um, it, it, I sound like a real old hag when I say that, but <laughs> it, um, yeah, oh, it's gutting, gutting to... Um, yeah, I wasn't out. That, that's the biggest thing. I wasn't out. That, that, that's probably the most gutting thing. Um, so you wake up in the night like this, do you? Yeah, I wake up in the night. So, <laughs> please. Um, yeah. Uh, it, you know, I, I don't even know how to put it in words. It, it's still, a, um, I suppose, everyone wants to have a test, uh, every, every top order batsman or batsman. Would love to score centuries, you know, and, and, and a test century is something that's eluded me, um, which, yeah, I'm still a little bit bitter about it and through my own doing, really. But, um, yeah, to be so close against that caliber of opposition in those conditions, um, yeah, it's still, it's still a reoccurring dream. <laughs> I think it's it's taken taken away the... Um, that dream where you wake up and you've got no pads and no gloves, no box, and you're still waiting to try and get it padded up before you get onto the crease. Uh, no, that's that's my reoccurring nightmare. You, you still managed to get a 50 at Lords, though, and uh, Sachin Tendulkar, yeah. I don't think he's got one, and I think Jack Callis has got one. So tell us who about are they? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's. Yeah. Uh, that was, again, a, a real enjoyable accomplishment, but I kicked myself for for not kicking on and getting 100. Um, <laughs> and I don't know if you, you know who got me out or how I got out in, in that innings, but, um, yeah, they had, had coped with the onslaught of a Harmison, a Hoggard, an Anderson, and a flint off and yeah was well in the driving seat the, the gate in the slope <laughs> and they brought me mark butcher on i was gonna say it was gonna be <laughs> and just yeah the most gentle of medium paces but the slope and yeah the eyes light up the ego gets pumped up and yeah go chasing a, a wide half volley um yeah, we got, got to the change room and, and a good friend of mine who was in the team at the time, um, he, he didn't play that game, but he was in the in the change room, uh, Mleleki and Kala. I'd gone through primary school and, and high school with him and yeah, sort of lived our whole life together. <laughs> I said one sort of patted me on the back and said bad luck and everything. He came to me and I won't repeat the exact words he said, but it was pretty much you dumb, blah, blah, blah. He said they were about to measure up your name on the bloody honors board. <laughs> so yeah, I, yeah, th those are probably the last in, uh, memory and, and words that I took from Lords, unfortunately. And again, as a young, as a young player, you you sort of take it a little bit for granted, and you think, oh, I know, we'll be back one day. Um, yeah, you know, I'll get a second chance. But uh, yeah, as life has it, there's often not many second chances that come around. Oh, just, just think about that. On the plus side, you've experienced exactly what us club cricketers go through because you know, we, we face the 65 to 70 mile an hour guy and we don't get out. And then the old guy, the 55-year-old, comes on bowling 45 mile an hour dobbers and we get out to him every week. So <laughs> I, I tell you, those are the most difficult bowlers to find. <laughs> oh. Yeah, no, at, at any level, it, it's just amazing. And that's the beauty of the game is that oh, <laughs> at any given time, any given delivery, yep, your name is on it. Okay, so from the sublime of that to the ridiculous of the 380, 
Matty Hayden, Australia. What was that like in the field? Was he dropped at any point? Or, or was oh, that yeah. Yeah, and, and again, I'm going to, yeah, the, you'll see the old cynic and the bitterness coming out. <laughs> again, should have been on LBW on 14. <laughs> Plum dead in, oh, yeah, dead as a daughter. Um, yeah, new, no neutral umpires again. Oh, shock, you know, us, us Minnow teams always got the, <laughs> the raw end of it. And, um yeah, he, he then proceeded to stand about two feet, and his two feet is most means, you know, a couple of meters outside the crease and just front footed everything. Um, and I think he, he was chanceless up to, up to, uh, and it was Lara's record at the time was 375, wasn't it? And I think he was on 371. And Chances up to then, and he's chipped up this absolute sitter, absolute sitter. And I, I think a lot of top cricketers in the UK will recall the name Mark Vermeulen. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. The uh, he buckets of hands. I mean, he had hands the size of baseball mitts, safe as houses under any catch. And it's just been a, a loopy shot too long. I think it was long on. And yeah, you put your house on him taking that. And he has absolutely spilled uh, an absolute sitter um, to then allow him to get Lara's record and then kick on. Um, yeah, just an absolute blitz of an innings. Um, just sheer power. And it was almost like he's been treating us with disdain. Um, at the time, and uh, one of the things that often get missed is Gilchrist came in, and I think he scored a eighty ball hundred as well on the other end. So yes, well, so it's just the the sheer power of Hayden on one end. Gilchrist just yeah, took us to the sword from from the other end as well. So yeah, it, it's definitely something that you wish you weren't on the end of or the receiving end of it, but it was yeah, something phenomenal to be a part of it in some way and experience it firsthand, albeit uh, chasing leather for you know, two days. You talked a couple of minutes ago about Zimbabwe being the minnows of test cricket at that time. How did you find you were treated? I mean, you didn't play many test matches, which seems to be the standard for Bangladesh as well and Afghanistan. But how did nations like Australia treat you guys off the pitch? Were, were they trying to help your game develop or was it a bit like we're here to win the game and then we'll disappear? Yeah, it, it, it was quite a strange time because obviously that was the period of the Australian dominance um, and Steve Waugh and the whole mental degradation of opposition. So what we really noticed was that teams such as England, South Africa, um, and even to certain extent, New Zealand really adopted this hardened attitude, you know, in trying to emulate the, the Aussie and, and that whole mental dominance. And we found that the attitude of of, of the English and, and the, the the South Africans in particular were, were really quite abrasive and, and um, how can I say, you know, almost condescending towards us, um, as a, and really made made us feel that you guys are the little boys and, and we'll treat you like that on and off the field. And I mean, we, you know, they would often, you know, after the end of a series or um, match, you know, come into the chain for a beer and, and there were just no interactions at all. And it was definitely, definitely a stance taken by the teams. It was strange because the Australians were, were the, was the one team, even though they had that dominance, they were the, the team that was very forthcoming, you know, they would send out an invite to come, you know, come join us for a beer after um, in the change room, or you'd see them in a cafe or a restaurant and they'd come over and say, you know, Hey, and chat to you about your game, not, not just the game in particular. They say, look, you know, I noticed this about your game. And I'll never forget. Um, we were at a bar um, in Harare and this was during, um, was it a one day series or, I think it was a one-day series that Australia were there. And, and 
Yes. And, and Langer came over and he said, and we had a, a, an amazing conversation, but that five, 10 minutes that you have a chat with Justin Langer, and I think I was about 21, 22 at the time. You gain more from that than probably about six or seven coaching sessions or, or training sessions. Um, you know, hearing things about his vulnerabilities and, and saying, you know, I can see this in your game. You know, have you tried this? Have you tried that? Um, but just very genuine about trying to improve the standard of cricket across the board, um, which is amazing. And I'll never forget after that, the Hayden 380, um, Steve Wall invited our team into the change room and, and they were sitting um, in, a, in a big circle and they said, you know, pick up, pull up a chair and come sit in, in the circle in and amongst. And, and there I was again, 23 years old, um, sitting next to Steve Wall and, you know, next to his bottle of Jack Daniels and, he said, you know, pour yourself a drink and let's talk, let's talk batting. And over the next sort of half an hour, 40 minutes, you know, getting insights of him and obviously at the back end of his career, but, you know, how he felt vulnerable at times, how he worked to overcome it and knowing that there wasn't any secret recipe or golden um, ticket or silver bullet in that sense, but just simple ways to navigate your way through through, through a, a career um, was amazing. And us as a team, you know, I think took a lot of value from those informal conversations, um, knowing that, well, you know, in a week's time when we play them in, in a one-day game, it's going to be absolutely helpful either because they, they're going to be coming hard and, and they'll be, yeah, that the mental degradation will still be there, but you know that it's the competitive nature of them because um, they want to, play their best to beat the best uh, on, on any given day. So um, it, it was very noticeable, the difference or the contrast in natures of the different teams at that time. Um, it's quite funny, you know, at, at the moment of the, with the Black Caps in New Zealand being the, the, almost the holier than now <laughs> team and, and winning the Spirit of Cricket Awards. Yeah, and a lot of people ask me, you know, yeah, who are the toughest team you know, that you guys played and who often... Yeah, always hoping or expecting to hear the Australians. And I often say, no, the Kiwis, the Kiwis and the and the Poms were, were often the, the two worst teams to come across um, in that sense. Uh, and obviously things have changed a lot now in, in international cricket, but yeah, it was very interesting in those days. It must have been difficult for Zimbabwe and other nations trying to develop their game, trying to learn how to play over five days when you're only playing a handful of test matches a year. Yes, um, it, it, it really was difficult. And again, it, it probably came to light when I think the likes of Jeff Marsh came and took over as, as head coach. And the big thing was because our first class depth wasn't, wasn't that great, you know, and, and at any given time, we probably had 24 to 28 um, quality players that, you know, were of that level. The unfortunate note is that you're often learning on the job. So you're learning again, you're learning your craft, you're learning your trade, you're learning how to, you're learning your batsmanship um, in the international arena, which yeah, is very unforgiving at the time. And it, the, the gap of there was getting smaller. Um, we, we had amazing facilities and systems and structures that were being put in place. And, and largely thanks to Dave Houghton, um, and the academy that he had set up and that was serving the purpose of bridging the gap, um, providing that next tier or that current crop of young players with the ability to fast track their development um, and become more equipped to, to survive international cricket. So, yes, it, it was a case of learning on the job. And, and, and again, when you only have a handful at best, you know, and, and talking about the Andy Flowers, the Heath Streaks, um, the Paul Strangs, um, you know, the Henry Alongas, you know, when you had only a handful of real quality, you know, and, and when I say quality, you're talking world class um, ability, you're not facing them on a regular basis in the sense that you're playing either with them or, or you know, against one of them. So you're not facing four heat streaks at a given time. So you're not developing your game against a seam attack that's of international quality. In domestic cricket, you, you gain away with, you know, 
um, overcoming his spell or one of the other player spells or knowing that uh, Andy Flower is banging at four and you've got a couple other batsmen around that you can really target. So it, it, it was difficult, but the gap was was getting less. Um, you know, the systems, the coaching structures that we had in place uh, and the playing program that was being put in place was definitely bridging the gap. But what as it was getting into a state or a stage where it was starting to have significance, you know, the other issues and, and um, problems sort of arose. And towards the end, you found yourself vice captain of Zimbabwe. What was that like? Again, <laughs> a bit of a roller coaster. It was at the height of a lot of off field problems and a lot of individuals being targeted for various reasons. And, and so it wasn't under circumstances where you've earned it and it's through you know, hard work and the fact that you are one of the, the, the leaders. It was almost by default the fact that you're one of the older, older players at 25, 26. Um, that was left behind. So it was a great honour to be, I suppose, asked to do it. Um, although it did come with its challenges and problems. And looking back again, it, it, the naivety of, of myself and, and a number of other individuals at that time, you know, we were just oblivious to what we were doing and what we were a part of and, and how our actions or behaviours were either contributing or contradictory um, what what was needed so yeah, um, yeah it was an yeah, interesting time and again probably caught the end of some 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 barrages of performances from opposition I think Sri Lanka put us to the sword we, I think we went for nearly 200 overs <laughs> a single car a double ton um, yeah during that period uh, and again, there were so many changes in the team and, and problems. Um, yeah, the, the stories that I could tell you <laughs> would have would probably be here for a couple of hours um, in that sense. But um, yeah, just interesting time and interesting dynamic. Um, yes, and the unfortunate thing was that there was a lot of the divide and conquer at, at that time. And, and probably my, my vice captain, C was part of that as well. Okay. Now, a lot's been written about what happened to Zimbabwe and what has happened to yourself and other players in the last 15 years or so. That's probably a story for another day rather than this interview because I think we're having quite a nice time talking about more pleasant stuff. But 2021, yeah. what's your take on where Zimbabwe is now as a cricketing nation? It's... It's it's quite sad, and I say it's quite sad for me personally because I've I've almost detached myself from from Zimbabwe, and not because I'm bitter or anything like that. It's because I've become so heavily invested in in cricket here in New Zealand and developing the players here and being part of the the, the programs here. So in doing so, I've, I've kind of I wouldn't say cut ties, but um, I'm solely focused on on what's happening yeah, more locally. Um, I still have a number of friends involved in the game there, a um, number of contacts over there that still communicate with. But I don't spend too much time, or, or I, I suppose, the, I'll word this carefully. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't. I don't think too great. A, um, I could say interest in, in what's going on from the day-to-day -day stuff um, happening there, just because of, you know, of, of my investment um, here in New Zealand. Um, although there's still a, a part of me or still a, a desire to, at some stage or time, you know, help or contribute to the resurgence or the re-establishment of, of, of the systems and structures back there um, in some way, shape or form. Do you think that's a realistic possibility or... Or do you see yourself in 10 years' time still being in New Zealand? Um, I, I, I think, well, it, it all depends. I, I know, obviously, and again, I alluded to some of the naivety and, and behaviours of, of myself as a, as a youngster. And I know there's probably bridges that have been burnt back, 
back in Zimbabwe from, from me going back and being involved, um, that still doesn't diminish the desire for me to, I suppose everyone's, you still have that burning passion in your, in your heart to give back to, to the country that you, 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 you from. Um, I, I don't know. I, I know at some stage I'll have to go overseas um, to further my um, coaching ambitions. Um, and where we overseas is at this stage, oh, who knows? But um, I still harbour hopes. I still harbour desires. Um, but I, I know that there's a lot of uh, moving parts in, in that puzzle. Okay, uh, we're we're nearly done, but I've got a couple of <laughs> That's <right. laughs> again. New Zealand then at the moment, and a question from your first team skipper from all those years ago. Has your poker game improved since moving to New Zealand? <laughs> My poker face has, that's, that's for sure. Um, I think one of the, the, the key things that I've learned whilst here in New Zealand um, is that uh, whilst I love to gamble, I'm a terrible gambler, um, which many of those poker players that stuff <laughs> will attest to. Um, I, I think I'm there for a good time, not a long time. Um, so it, it, my game hasn't improved, but yes, my poker face has. And just finally, then we're, we're probably about ten weeks away from the start of the season over here. It's it's been cold. We've had minus six, minus seven overnight, so it doesn't feel like cricket weather. But COVID dependent, we're hoping to get started back end of April, and you know, looking forward to a really exciting season at Stony. So, what would be your message to the guys that you know at the club? Just, just to finish the video off. Yeah, I, I, I suppose my message would first start with a, with a big thank you. Um, I think Sonia Stratford and, and the club and the club members and in particular the, the members of that first team um, definitely have played a, a massive part in my uh, my life, but my, my career. I was just saying to, to my wife this morning, you know, uh, I was really excited to do this because of the significance that the club has played. I said, you know, I would not be sitting here in New Zealand with the, the life we have if it wasn't for the club. And then I can say that wholeheartedly because if it wasn't for them, I would. I don't think I'd be back involved in, with, with cricket. I think cricket would have been a long gone um, hobby or passion of mine uh, in the distant memory. So yeah, it's a, it's a big wholehearted thanks to, to everyone at the club for everything that they contributed, uh, you know, as significant or insignificant as, as a part they, they may or may not have played. Um, yes, yeah, so I still do miss Rowena's uh, tees, I must say. Um, best tees on the circuit, uh, they were, or, or I, if, they, if she's still doing them. Um, but yeah, just a big, massive thank you and, and a big good luck, really. Uh, I know things are very challenging over there at this current period of time and obviously with a hell of a lot of uncertainty not only from the cricket season but you know life in general um, I do hope that things fall into place so that the club and the members can I suppose find their home again back at Oscars Lane it, it's definitely a, a club atmosphere that yeah, you struggle to find in many places it, it's definitely got something very very unique and um, yeah, I, I think it's necessary for, for everyone's well-being that the club is, is up running again to its full capacity. Um, I wish the club and the members and, and all the teams you know, all the best for the season ahead and hopefully there's silverware or some awards um, on the horizon. But if not, I know Saturday nights and Friday nights will definitely be a good place to be um, at the club. Um, and hopefully I'll be back for a game of poker at some stage. <laughs> to lose my money. Like us, follow us, watch us. It's Stony Stratford Cricket Club.